Hi, how you doing? Good, I hope. I've been doing an awful lot of studying. And I'm, the issue that's most gathered together, <clears throat> I have a very old book here I've had for many, many years. And it's shabby. It's a <clears throat> symbolic interaction, a reader in social psychology. And I think this will help me figure out sociology and political science. In fact, <clears throat> the psychology about this, which is hooked together, it had a little uh, paragraph here that I think really describes it. Man, as a person, is an historical creation and can most readily be understood in terms of the roles which he enacts and incorporates. These roles are limited by the kind of social institutions in which he happens to be born and in which he matures into an adult. His memory, his sense of time and space, his perception, his motives, his conception of his self, his psychological functions are shaped and steered by the specific configuration of roles which he incorporates from his society. Which uh, is going to teach me a lot about it, <laughs> for sure. This big book is late, and i got to get back to the library. I've been banned from there anyway. The Oxford Handbook of Comparative Politics, and it tells a lot. Look how thick it is. Oh my god. And I'd like to tell you how their chapters run and what they have in them. But if you read about political science, I sug strongly suggest you have a dictionary close by or on the computer <clears throat> to look up some of these words. They're very complicated. <clears throat> and in chapter one, with the introduction, uh, the first couple of paragraphs. Why do authoritarian states democratize? What accounts for the contours, dynamics, and ideologies of the nation state? Under what conditions do civil wars and revolutions erupt? Why is political representation channeled through political parties in contemporary democracies? Why do some parties run on policy programs, others on patronage? Can citizens use elections and courts to hold governments accountable? These are some of the crucial questions that comparative political scientists address, and they are the questions, among others, around which this volume is organized. We asked a set of top scholars in the field of comparative politics to write critical surveys of areas of scholarship in which they are expert. We assembled the volume with two guiding principles. First, we are committed to the possibility and the desirability of generating a systemic body of theoretical knowledge about politics. The discipline advances, we believe, through the theoretical discovery and innovation. Second, we embrace a Catholic approach to comparative methodology. Don't forget that sentence. In the following paragraphs, we offer an overview of our author's contributions with occasional critical commentary of our own or additional thoughts on the directions in which the future research should go. And if you want to really find out what's going on in politics, read this book. This is the Politician's Bible. Oh yeah, it is. Okay, what I thought really interesting in here was on page 12. Number four, political instability, political conflict. Revolutions, civil wars, and social movements are central objects of study in comparative politics. Blending his training as a historian with a keen interest in comparative analysis 
Stephen Pincus examines the historical conditions that generate revolutionary episodes. He asks, why do revolutions occur and why do they have dramatically different outcomes? Scholars have argued that revolutions occur exclusively as a result of social and economic modernization. Scopole and Huntington, Huntington. More recently, an influential line of argument brought forth by Goldstone has framed revolutions as the outbreak that follows a Malathusian imbalance between a growing population and its environment. By contrast, according to Pincus, the necessary prerequisite for revolution was always state modernization. State modernization programs simultaneously brings new social groups and new regions into direct contact with the state and legitimize ideologies of change. These two developments create a social bias and a language on which to build revolutionary movements. Revolutions lead to very different political outcomes, in part following in the steps of Barrington Moore Jr., Pincus argues that revolutions lead to open democratic regimes when the state relies on merchant communities and foreign trade. Absent the latter, however, revolutions typically result in the imposition of an authoritarian regime. Where Perlowski alerts us to the omnipresence of endogeneity problems, Calvus alerts us to their centrality in a subject that reality is placed centrally on the agenda of comparatives, comparativists, civil wars. Calavis reviews a plethora of studies of civil wars that offer a plethora of independent variables, features of the societies before the civil war broke out, or features of combatants in their pre-war incarnations. These pre-war outbreak features of societies and combatants ostensibly explain the likelihood of civil wars occurring. Their duration once they occur or the intensity of the violence they unleash. But such extragenous explanations Calvius explains may be wrong-headed. Much changes as civil wars unfold, including the distribution of populations, the preferences of key actors, and the value of resources over which combatants seek control. These new war-driven conditions are themselves likely to shape the outcome of interest. Collective and individual preferences, he writes, strategies, values, and identities are continuously shaped and reshaped in the course of a war, while the war itself aggregates all kinds of cleavages from the most ideological to the most local, which was a part that showed me that the political scientists Go to sociology classes first. That backs political science. Sidney Tarot and Char Charles Tilley examine contentious politics, episodic public collective action, and social movements, sustained challenge to holders of power. They analyze the ways in which these contentious politics and social movements happened in a dynamic sequence. The authors observe that modernization and the spread of democracy spawned the inter invention of social movements, yet at the same time the time and location of social movements, that is, their interaction with political institutions, society, and cultural practices determine the form in which they emerged. Tarot and Tilly conclude by reflecting on the impact that globalization may have had on the processes of political and social mo mo mobilization as we know them. They ask whether globalization may more or less automatically connect potential activists across the world, present them with similar challenges, and thus move social movement collective action away from the local and national concerns. Their answer is probably not. Domestic political factors and involvement of national states and international organizations are the best predictors of participation in transnational contention. And my question is, 
how long before all of these movements started in our nation was this written? Hmm. Some more research. Look back and devise chapter complements that of tarot and televised surveying theories of contentious politics in light of recent global protest movements. To fully understand the phenomenon of contentious politics, they remind us that we need to operate at three levels. <clears throat> at the macro level, researchers have developed a vast array of explanations that span from precise economic structural theories such as the impact of trade on the welfare of populations, to cultural hypotheses, for example, the impact of modernization on the perception of elites in underdeveloped countries, to the emergence of a global civil society or global institutions that permit generalized protest and act as focal points. These macro-level stories must be complemented with meso-level causes, in particular the insights of strategic political opportunity theory that makes protest feasible. Finally, understanding contentious politics involves comprehending the macro-level components of action, the motives that bring individuals to the fore, their resources, their prior commitments, and the network networks of that rear them in political action. And I wondered, <clears throat> I never quite knew what this was for, and when I heard about it, I always wondered uh, how people work for this and who did they work for and what kind of stuff was they doing? Well, I'd bet a nickel that this is one of the high price things a political candidate, especially the Republicans, pay for political scientists, scientists to come and work for them so they know how to manipulate and trick people into voting for them. Uh, this is just my idea. We'll see more later. And this is on page 350, 3.2, res Respectifying Civic Culture. Working often independently of one another, a rich mix of political scientists, <clears throat> game theorists, historians, sociologists, and other social scientists has generated considerable literature going beyond the standard meaning of civic culture. Three advances are especially important for our purpose. One strand deals with trust. Originally, trust was considered a critical dimension of the syndrome of positive attitudes or political orientations that went into the making of civic culture. Allman and Burba, 1963. Unfortunately, the comparative literature of the 1970s did not seriously engage in further explorations of trust. Credit must go to Diego Gambetta, 1988, for placing trust on the research agenda again across the entire range of social, economic, and political life. Since then, interest in trust has mushroomed. Oh, indeed. We can't find any. One problem brought to light by Tilly, <clears throat> 2000, oh, that's a big page I guess, is that much of this literature has generally neglected, <clears throat> excuse me, to draw attention to the fact that people have created and recreated trust networks as endogenous me mechanisms for sustaining networks for markets interpersonal credit, and other forms of economic and social organization. The interactive process required to integrate these trust networks in public national politics was, however, rarely available, often unstable, and generally hostile. Support for this new view can be called up from research in different parts of the world. A few illustrations should suffice. Going beyond the formal institutions of government, some analysts have uncovered dense trust networks in the form of local and civil civic organizations in the history of Latin American democracy. Format 2003. These networks have been characterized as a form of civic Catholicism. Catholicism. Gee, I didn't say it right the first time. Imagine that. 
to distinguish them in a provocative way from political models developed for the North Atlantic world and too hastily universalized. Civic Catholicism was stronger in Mexico than in Peru, but its basic outlines were similar in both nations to the point of treating it as con constitutive of democratic life in Spanish America in the same way that Protestantism and Republicanism were constitutive of modern democracy in Britain, the Dutch Republics, and the United States. The critical problem in Latin America, explored more in depth in other studies, is that trust, trust could not extend to macro-political orders grounded as they were in constitutions of tyranny. What happened in Quebec with a somewhat similar kind of civic Catholicism helps to understand what kind of macro-political order complements democratic trust networks. Research has discovered that Catholic action youth movements of the 1930s and other such organizations played a central role in formulating the religious ideology underlying the quiet revolution in the 1960s. This is why recent research has placed in sharp relief the Catholic origins of the transformation of the Quebec vision of society and state. The relative success of Quebec's own brand of civic Catholicism came to depend on the constitution of Canadian federalism. Trust networks developed in the Sicilian countryside with the rise of Christian democracy in the 1890s suggest some important and not just temporal differences from the civic Catholicism found in the New World. The steadily increasing improvements that followed in Sicily with the spread of Christian democracy in the late 1890s drew attention to the as yet unremitied problem of absence of law and order in the countryside. The lesson in working together that had been learned through church-sponsored associations was extended by some villagers to overcome the problem of public security in the countryside. This is how the Mafia in Villabal had often described as the capital of the Mafia emerged in the late 1890s. This development lends support to Gambetti's view that private protection has been a distinguishing feature of the Sicilian Mafia, but not necessarily to his treatment of the Mafia as the price of public mistrust. The emergence of the Villabal Mafia by the late 1890s had more to do with the spirit of community problem solving that had been learned by working together in voluntary associations than with the price of mistrust of formal public institutions as such. A chief conclusion that we can take for comparative analysis is that mistrust Networks like the Mafia are not constant. They are variable and do not endure forever, even among the same population. See also Sembetti, 2006. <clears throat> and there's a lot more in here about it. And you can see who is controlling the politics in your community those who tell you who to vote for they ain't a church no more they're a political agency or a mafia and we got a lot of mafia actions going on here in Oklahoma okay now we got in another interesting part of it in here for me <clears throat> The neoliberal institutional trilemma, NIT, or the impossible trinity of an integrated global economy, strong MEIs, independent states, strong developmental coalitions that can make and implement national economic policies, and active civil societies, conventional democratic politics that allows protectionist groups to influence the state. 
The problem is that the white states want international institutions to promote economic efficiency, mass publics demand that their governments safeguard them, and neither international institutions nor the governments which have ceded sovereignty and agree to economic integration managed by international institutions can be held accountable as easily. And I'll bring you up some more points in this and finish off in my next one. i got to take a swift break. Hi. As I was saying, um... <clears throat> Mass publics demand that their governments safeguard them, and neither international institutions nor the governments which have ceded sovereignty and agreed to economic integration managed by international institutions can be held accountable as easily. Roderick, in 2001, thus formalizes Ruggie's 1982 and 1991 arguments about embedded liberalism as follows. <clears throat> if we want dem democratically active civil societies, we can have either integrated national economies or independent states. If we want integrated national economies, we can have either independent states or democratically active civil societies. If we want independent states, we can have either integrated national economies or democratically active civil societies. Neoliberals, therefore, can have two things, but not all three at once. Hence, there are two important trade-offs. For a given level of integrated national economies, the more independent the states, the less active the democratic civil societies. For a given level of independent nation states, the more integrated the national economy, the less active the democratic civil society. And here is where the global democratic deficient mechanisms and thus anti-globalization protests becomes relevant. Neoliberalism is not the best of all possible worlds because people are complaining about its institutions. The Battle of Seattle, for instance, was a fight about the WTO and global governments. <clears throat> More specifically, while the neoliberal global order might lead to peace, although critics claim that competition among capitalist states is more likely than cooperation among them, and while it might even lead to prosperity, although critics claim that in the race to the bottom the rich get richer and few benefits trickle down to the poor, which is true, the neoliberal global order has produced political instability because it generates redistributive redistrip <laughs> redistrib Tributive conflicts over the democratic nature of its institutions. Thus, the neoliberal institutional trilemma asserts that the neoliberal rhetoric about democracy exceeds the neoliberal grasp because neoliberal globalization puts democracy in a golden straitjacket constructed by international and state institutions that forces political parties to the median voter while opening up civil society to, to the proliferation of special interests. In a democracy that is, neoliberalism contracts political electoral space, openness to international trade forecloses Keynesian macroeconomic policies and welfare state social policies while neoliberalism expands social, civil society, space, issues of trade, neoliberalism, and capitalism involve more and more constituencies. The spread of democracy, at least a rhetorical part of NIT, has also contributed to the rise of civil society through the call for participation, accountability, and transparency. As cosmopolitan and international consciousness rise, the polit poli policy agenda 
widens even further as more voices demand access. Neoliberal institutional trilemma theories thus suggest that the protest is likely in democracies with integrating economies. In globalized democracies where international economic integration coincides with threats to state independence or in globalizing democracies where state independence coincides with poor international economic integration. Further, in the former globalized and largely northern countries, protesters are likely to make claims that focus on threats to state sovereignty and civil society caused by the integration of national economies, whereas in the latter globalizing and largely southern countries, protesters are likely to focus on inequality and exclusion in the global market. The highest level of protest is most likely when the NIT is most salient. In globalized democracies during crisis when state power is noticeably lessened, or in the globalizing democracies when poor international economic integration causes domestic problems like increased unemployment, decreased wages, and increased prices. For instance, unilateral military intervention by a hegemon like the USA is likely to incite northern protests because it makes state sovereignty in a globalized world seem weaker and domestic economic crises like those in Latin America during the 1990s are likely to spur southern protests because they make southern exclusion from the global market in a globalizing world more salient. Further, globalized democracies, protest coalitions are less likely to involve material interests than globalizing democracies, protest coalitions. Protesters are likely to be opposed to neoliberal globalization to support national autonomy and to support inclusive economic development. In that last sentence, I need to research more so I know what some of these people on YouTube are arguing about on some of these issues. And 2.6.2 attribution, attribution of threat to democracy. Activists have also connected protests with the pursuit of democracy. Using the threat to democracy attribution, attribution mechanism, activists argue they are targeting a global economic system which threatens the sovereignty of the people and claim that they desire democratic institutional changes in these MEIs. Danner and Burback, 2000. <coughs> Excuse me. Dissent is framed as a struggle for democracy as depicted in the following quotes. Most civil society groups are all fighting for fundamental democratic rights and the anti-corporate insurrection is a rebellion that seeks to reclaim democracy. Barlow and Clark, 2002. Danner and Mark, 2003. Further, the Norberg Hodge indicates how economic integration is tied together with threats to sovereignty and problems of dependence, arguing that economic globalization is leading to the erosion of democracy. 2001. The solution, according to the activists, rests with empowering the people as the ultimate political authority or combating threats to democracy. Brecher, Costello, and Smith in the year 2000. Danner and Mark, 2003. Activists therefore emphasize threats to democracy as a problem and suggest democratic reforms and democratic power to the people as solutions. Academics, on the other hand, focus on groupings of structures of economic integration and democratic civil society that facilitates activists' dissent. Activists and academics are thus connecting problems during economic integration with threats to democracy. Further, both suggest that the solutions lie in people power, <clears throat> dissent, and democratic reforms. <clears throat> 
While academics put forth the global democratic deficient structural mechanism, focusing on how increasing integration in democratic states leads to dissent, activists suggest the threat to democracy attribution mechanism, which connects economic globalization and democracy through grievances and solutions. And, on page 906, 7, the other political market, imperfection, incomplete information. A substantial literature identifies significant development effects from incomplete citizen information, which, in my words, uh, they are not listening to the people anymore. They they have built little think tanks and using sociologists, political scientists, and all these other groups charging money for their information to see what they can get away with or if there's any honest ones, how they can help. But they are not listening to us people anymore. They're listening to people demanding pay for the info and smothering our voices as individuals in America. Okay, let me get back to this. It gets me upset. <laughs> <clears throat> A substantial literature identifies significant development effects from incomplete citizen information. The other key political market imperfection to which the discussion in this essay gives short shrift. In many ways, however, the foregoing discussion applies equally to information, since the key effect of incomplete information is to prevent citizens from verifying whether politicians have fulfilled their promises. Absent veri veri veritability, promises are empty. The presence of uninformed voters distorts political decision-making in at least two ways. First, politicians expend resources to sway uninformed voters. That's when they're hiring these students or workers now. Obligating themselves to special interests in the process. Grossman and Hep Helpman, 1996. Second, politicians simply ignore uninformed voters and are more corrupt. Oh, we got it going here in Oklahoma. Adazura, Boex, and Payne in 2003 written. Or less apt to extend access to government programs. Vesley and Burgess, 2002. Stromberg, 2004. The earlier credibility discussion is relevant as well because citizen information is directly susceptible to government influence. Governments can place restraints on the press or on the journalistic access to state secrets. They can favor supporters in allegating rights to media ownership, or they can censor. They can also simply own the media. This turns out to be important because in much of the research in this area, scholars have used newspaper circulation as a proxy for voter information. Newspaper circulation is certainly relevant for development. In 1995, among countries that hold competitive elections, newspaper circulation was much higher and richer than in poorer countries. However, Kiefer shows that the newspaper circulation is much lower in countries in which the market share of government newspapers is higher. The connection between the measurement of information and the earlier credibility discussion is immediate. Information is a public good, and it's also a right. Like all public goods, therefore, it is least likely to be provided or most likely to be restricted when po political competitors are unable to make credible promises to voters. If this is the case, newspaper circulation <clears throat> may capture the latent credibility of pre-electoral political promises in addition to or instead of extragenous vari variations across countries and over time in voter information. Consistent with this, Kiefer points to evidence that the negative effects of newspaper circulation on targeted expenditures of government 
such as government wages, are exactly what one would predict if newspaper circulation reflected government efforts to influence access to information. And I think a lot of this information is hid, and I think that's why they started charging for TVs to watch a TV and some news and make money off of it. And there's no point in any of these public people getting any more government substances for news, whether they're propaganda or not, because us poor people that can't pay for a TV don't get it at all. We're being blinded on the side. In conclusion, after decades of research, the theme of democracy and economic development remains as important a topic of investigation as ever. The literature now has rich explanations for why some countries democratize and others do not, why democracy is associated with rapid economic development in some countries and not in others, why policy choices favor development in some democracies and not others. That is, why non-elites will fail to benefit from the policies of elected governments. The conclusion of this essay is that the problem of credible commitment is at the core of each of these advances, but the precise role of commitment differs. The democracy and development literature points to the inability of elites and non-elites to make credible agreements with each other in order to explain why some countries have successfully democratized. These same arguments do not explain as easily performance variation among democracies. Poorly performing democracies do not seem to exhibit the inequality redistributive distrib tendencies <clears throat> and conflict over redistribution between elites and non-elites that this literature predicts. Other arguments focusing on the credibility of promises from politicians to supporters, e.g. from the leaders of non-elites to the non-elite, can fill this gap. <coughs> Poor performance emerges in, emerges in some democracies, not because the conflict between elites and non-elites is more difficult to resolve, but because political competitors are unable to make credible promises to voters in the first place. History matters for the story of democracy as well since democracies differ significantly <clears throat> in the extent to which they enjoy a legacy of political competitors able to make credible policy commitments to voters or of patrimonialism that makes politicians reluctant to build up broad credibility with voters. This in turn links back to the literature focused on elites and non-elites since it it is precisely when political competitors can make credible policy commitments that we expect non-elites to be able to act collectively to force elites to give up power. Better understanding these historical links between political credibility and successful democratization is crucial to improving the success of the contemporary efforts by wealthy democracy to deepen democratization among the world's poor countries. And I have no doubt they are using this good information to do their bad and to hide their bad for the corrupt ones. And I wanted to uh, tell you what's all in here. Part one is the introduction. <clears throat> Part two, theory and methodology. And number two is multicausality context, conditionality, and endogeneity. Number three is historical inquiry and comparative politics. Number four, the case study, what it is and what it does. Number five, field research. Number six, the science of comparative politics possible. Number seven, from case studies to social science, a strategy for political research. And eight is collective action theories. Part three is states and state information political consent. War and trade and state formation. Compliance, consent, and legitimacy. National identity, ethnicity, and ethnic conflict. And the next part, 
political regimes and transitions, mass beliefs and democratic institutions. What causes democratization? Democracy and civic culture, dictatorship and analytic approaches. And five, political instability, political conflict, rethinking revolutions, a neo turkovilian perspective, civil wars, contentious politics and social movements, mechanisms of globalized protest movements. Part six, mass political mobilization, the emergence of parties and party systems. Party systems, voters and parties, parties and voters in emergent democracies, political clientelism, political activism, new challenges, new opportunities, and I believe that's seven, Pro processing political demands, aggregating and representing political preferences, electoral systems, separation of power, comparative judicial politics, Federalism, coalition theory, and government formation. And the last one, <clears throat> governance and comparative perspective. Comparative studies of the economy and the vote. Context conditional political budget cycles. The welfare state and global perspective. The poor performance of poor democracies. Accountability and the survival of governments. Economic transformation and comparative politics. And, and also, if you read about this and study on it and find out about uh, political science, then you can start to see who some of the people are called the Big Brother. Because they watching us. Have a great evening or morning, wherever you are, day or night later.